You're listening to the Weller Christian Podcast. I'm your host, Mark Stanley, and today we're going to have a conversation about religion and society. In Genealogy of Morals, the book that Nietzsche wrote in 1887, his third essay is all about Christianity and religion and what it actually does for people. And the conversation is focused around whether people are better off with a Christian worldview or they would be better off without the Christian worldview. And this is an important and timely conversation since our culture continues to find itself leaning more and more secular and deciding more and more often that we want religion to get out of our education system, out of our policy making, and our out of our lives, really. And so, therefore, there's been a lot of conversation about whether religion, Christianity specifically, is a force for good or a force for evil uh, today and historically. And even though the position that Christianity is an evil and sinister influence on society is historically rare, at least in this hemisphere, there are more and more intellectuals who say that Christianity oppresses people and supports slavery and is basically just an evil ideology of times past and needs to be eradicated uh, more or less, whether they really mean that uh, aggressively or whether they just mean it needs to not be supported, it needs to die a slow and natural death. But before we get too deep into it, I want to remind you uh, of ways that you can show your gratitude for the podcast. You can leave a review on Facebook and iTunes. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel, interact with us on social media, things like that. There's also been a lot of work put into the website, wellreadchristian.com. I make sure to update that blog uh, at least twice a month. So go check it out. Click around. I'm sure you will find something that is at least of equal value as whatever else you do when you surf the web and you sit down on your computer and you open up a bunch of tabs. So to lay down the roadmap of what we're going to talk about today, I'm just going to come straight out and say that this episode turned out to be so interesting to me and so important and so long. And so I ended up chopping it in half and separating it. And uh, you'll, you'll hear the other half next week. And in this episode, I just want to focus on Nietzsche. I want to get his ideas out there. I want to address them. I want to go deep. And then I want to put Nietzsche back on the shelf and we'll be done with Nietzsche. So the first thing we're going to discuss in this podcast is why the conversation matters, why you should care what Nietzsche's view of religion and nihilism is, how those things fit together, and the impact that it's had in our modern society. And so you're going to hear a little bit of overlap next week when we talk about how Jesus impacted and influenced the West and the world. Um, but I want to start out, and I actually want to get into the habit of that, I want to start out in telling you why the conversation matters, why it's relevant, why it's timely, why it's important for you to be a educated and thoughtful person in this arena. And then after that, we'll talk about Nietzsche's actual perspective, his view of religion, Christianity, nihilism, uh, what he calls the ascetic ideal. And then next week, we'll talk about the more generic new atheist attack on Christianity, and I'll try to respond to that. So all good stuff lined up, and let's jump right on into it. So, to jump right in, I'm going to straight away tell you why this conversation is important. I want the relevance of these ideas to be at the forefront of your mind rather than kind of tacking it on at the end like I usually do. This probably be a better habit to get into anyway because I want you to understand that this conversation is going to define what the world will look like in 50 years. Because Nietzsche knew that this conversation would decide the future, he said that the non-religious will win the debate and when the non-religious side wins, and they should win because they're right, that the world will burn. He said that when people lose their faith in Christianity, they will lose the benefits that Christianity gives them, including a sense of meaning and purpose and a grounding for morality and a direction of life and a sense of order and some being that's out there orchestrating the universe for the good of everyone in it. That will all be gone. And when you lose the rules and the moral laws that Christianity provides and has provided for 2,000 years, you will lose many, many people as they scramble to find better answers to those questions. And as, as I've said repeatedly in the past two episodes, Nietzsche's view can be summed up this way. If you take away belief in God, you take away belief in God's rules. And God's rules mean morality. They mean the sense of love your neighbor as yourself, the sense of justice and goodness and, and duty and, and the upholding of love over hate or, or contentment over jealousy or, or whatever else. Nietzsche says that, well, maybe hate and jealousy is actually more valuable than 
love and mercy and whatever else. Maybe those are just weak and pathetic virtues that basically Christianity has thrust upon us and dominated us for so long that we're blind to how destructive those quote unquote virtues could really be. And so when you lose a sense of that morality or the meaning of life and, and, or, or a value of the afterlife and a sense of belonging, you're going to lose millions of people who will die in the 20th century as people scramble to find answers to those questions. And Nietzsche was basically right. As society continued to reject God, we also continued to feel a God-shaped hole. And in the 20th century, mankind tried to fill that hole by turning to a utopian vision of prosperity. And they placed their faith in national leaders who promised to usher in a utopia. And they failed. Lenin, Stalin, Mao, Hitler, they all died before ushering in any kind of a utopia. And really the end result of all of their regimes were mass casualties, mass corpses. And now the world doesn't really know what to do. We've lost the answers that Christianity gave. And when the government came in and said, you can be a part of something greater, join us and usher in heaven on earth, the result was no heaven on earth and piles upon piles of bodies. Now we're all just kind of looking at each other like, wow, well, we're glad that's done. The happiness that people tried to find was not found in their utopian visions of planet Earth. And the observations that Nietzsche made and that we have been talking about were never addressed by the world. The God-shaped hole is still gaping. And when the human race turned to the answers of fascism and communism, nihilism, after rejecting Christianity, they found that, wow, those are not good answers. But we're not turning back to Christianity. So we still need to find answers to those questions. Christianity used to offer answers. But since being rejected and replaced by fascism, communism, and nihilism, now we really don't know where to turn. So it's been interesting. It's been interesting. Recent history is very fascinating when you look at the Vietnam War, the Korean War, the, the Cold War, really, and the results of that and how the whole world is very small and we're all pointing nuclear weapons at each other and each nation is subtly vying for power and individuals are descending into an abyss of nihilism and escapism and political activism in order to try to fill that void that is still gone. And I suppose we're just waiting for a new voice to speak to the deepest parts of society. And I suppose we're all just hoping that when that new voice is heard, it isn't the voice of another Hitler or a Stalin or a Mao or a Pol Pot or a Castro. So as I said a moment ago, I want to talk about the relevance of the question at hand and why it matters. And I've kind of alluded to it before already, but I want to really hit this point home. Last week, I quoted Viktor Frankl extensively in an attempt to illustrate why the question of the grounding of morality was very important. And I'd actually like to quote it again, this time to make a similar point. And that is that society's view of religion is important because society's view of religion is going to be society's view of how to answer the questions that we've been talking about. Namely, what is the meaning of life? Why should I take responsibility for my actions? What is the right thing to do and why should I care? How can I find happiness or should I expect it in this life or the next life? Those questions are fundamental to the human experience. And Viktor Frankl says the way the society answers those questions will determine that society's morality, that society's livelihood. And so if we don't want to repeat Nazi Germany or Stalin's Russia or Mao's China, we have to be conscious as a society of how we answer those questions. So let me read you the quote. If we present man with a concept of man which is not true, we may well corrupt him. When we present him as an automation of reflexes, as a mind machine, as a bundle of instincts, as a pawn of divine reactions, as a mere product of heredity and environment, we feed the nihilism to which modern man is, in any case, prone. I became acquainted with the last stage of corruption in my second concentration camp, Auschwitz. The gas chambers of Auschwitz were the ultimate consequence of the theory that man is nothing but the product of heredity and environment, or, as the Nazis like to say, of blood and soil. 
I am absolutely convinced that the gas chambers of Auschwitz, Treblinka, and Maidenek were ultimately prepared not in some ministry or other in Berlin, but rather at the desks and in the lecture halls of nihilistic scientists and philosophers, end quote. What Frankel is saying is that your view of what a human being is will directly relate to how you are willing to treat one. The gas chambers of Auschwitz were the ultimate consequence of the theory that man is nothing but the product of heredity and environment, or as the Nazis like to say, blood and soil. Do you believe that man is just blood and soil? Because if so, you're telling me that ultimately you believe that there is no difference between putting a pizza in an oven and putting a Jew in an oven. The only difference is the arrangement of molecules. That's it. Now, I'm not saying that you would put a Jew in an oven if you only believe that man is blood and soil, but what I'm saying is that your belief system is parallel, is compatible with Nazi ideology or any other ideology which throws away life by the millions. So if we're serious about establishing a strong and healthy and just society for all, if we care about the integrity of our institutions, about the future for our children and grandchildren, the battle starts at the desks and in the lecture halls of scientists and philosophers. Because once the entire world picks up arms to kill each other over these ideas, it is already too late. We need to win the battle of ideas before the battle for arms ever begins. So that's why the conversation is important, because the way a society answers the question of where did man come from, what is mankind, does God exist, is there an afterlife, should we be held accountable for our actions, when, where, and how would any of that take place, and is morality a real thing? All of those questions dictate the direction a society takes, and a direction that an individual human being takes. So I can't really think of a more important conversation than the broad conversation of religion and society. So now we're going to shift gears, and I want to tell you Nietzsche's part of the conversation, Nietzsche's contribution to whether Christianity is helpful or harmful. And if you listen to my introduction to Genealogy of Morals, you'll recall that towards the end, I explained that the third essay in Nietzsche's book is an attempt to understand what Nietzsche calls the ascetic ideal. Nietzsche wants to know what exactly is going on when people find an idea beautiful and they pursue it with their entire lives. They're even willing to die for it. And it doesn't just have to be a religious idea, but he's talking about it in the context of religion. Why do people go to church and listen to sermons and read their Bibles and pray and have spiritual conversations? And I paused the conversation right here two weeks ago and deviated to talk about Nietzsche's view of atheists and his denunciation of these fake atheists who call themselves non-believers, but they act out an ascetic ideal. They act out their Christian belief in certain covert ways. Like, for example, they ask questions of the world and expect truthful answers. Nietzsche says that if you believe in truth at all, or if you believe in a Christian morality, or you pursue science, which is based on the trust of truth, then you're living your life in a way that is more in line with the Christian worldview than the atheist worldview. So that conversation took place two weeks ago, and it was a really good one. But now we're going to actually stay the course and talk about Nietzsche's view of any ascetic ideal. And and he slams atheists or so-called atheists for having an ascetic ideal, even though they claim to be atheists. But obviously, he slams Christians and other religious people for having an ascetic ideal and what that actually does for them. So why do religious people pursue their religion? Or more generally, why do people pursue their ascetic ideal? Why do people strive to contort themselves to be in line with their most cherished beliefs? Or to put it more simply, Why do people believe in Christianity or any other grand paradigm? Even if the paradigm is atheistic, why do people have a set of ideas that they believe and they strive for, and they tell themselves what's true when they look in the mirror? Well, basically, Nietzsche concludes that the ascetic ideal are transcendent ideas used by primitive and weak people to stave off nihilism. And nihilism, I'm sure you'll recall, is the radical overthrow of all values and morals. 
It's the realization that nothing matters and anything you do is irrelevant because no one will care and it doesn't make a difference and everything is going to end up in the same state because the sun's going to explode and in a million years or no one's going to remember or, or even in a hundred years no one's going to remember or even in 10 years no one's going to care. Nothing you do matters and this is a scary idea and people don't want to wake up in the morning and go to work five days a week and feel that sinking anchor in your gut that suspects that everything you do is pointless and nobody really cares about you and even if they did it would make no difference and people are afraid of that reasonably so and so they plug that hole with an ascetic ideal a beautiful idea a transcendent lie something to tell themselves when they look in the mirror and say well, it all happens according to God's plan or everything happens for a reason and other kinds of things that we tell ourselves when we look in the mirror. Religion serves its purpose by offering one crafty lie that fulfills many longings, according to Nietzsche. God is the one-stop shop for easy answers to hard questions. So, for example, religion offers an explanation for your suffering. Of course, your suffering is meaningless, says Nietzsche. Everything is meaningless. Isn't that perfectly obvious? Do you remember or care about anybody who came before you that is now dead? Do you care about their suffering? Of course not. They're already dead. And nobody will care about you once you're dead. Think of the millions of people who have died, and you have not the slightest clue that they were ever even born. And more, you don't really care that they ever existed. Heck, Think of the millions of people alive right now that you don't care at all about their suffering. So suffering is meaningless and life is pointless and nothing matters, says Nietzsche. Of course, that's obvious, but that's a very hard pill to swallow and that will make people become deeply nihilistic. They'll, they'll revolt against all of their values and morals and people don't want that. And so they believe in God and a host of angels and they'll believe that their grandparents are with them and that their ancestors are watching over them or, or that karma is following them and keeping track of everything good or bad that they do. And if you only knew the immaterial substructures that are watching and encouraging and sympathizing, then you would continue to act well. And so religion gives people an invisible audience in order to feel special and worthwhile and valuable. So that's the secret. That's why there are so many people who believe in religious ideas. That's the motivation to believe in religious ideas. Not because they're true, not because you could prove them. Obviously, you can't do any of those things, says Nietzsche. But the role of Christianity today and all religion, the ascetic ideal is the pursuit of the ideas that make ourselves feel better about the obvious nature of the world. But this ends up being a corrosive force that is eating away at us and of Europe and obviously the West in general, he would say, because we continually suspect that we are lying to ourselves. And as that suspicion grows, the antidote to nihilism becomes worse than the sickness itself. The lies that we tell ourselves become more damaging than the nihilism that we're trying to keep away from us. And so Nietzsche says that Christianity has gotten to the point where it is effective at holding the quote-unquote sick and nihilistic people from being forces of violent destruction, but it is ultimately building up a dam of potential. And that potential energy is going to burst in an incredible way in the next 200 years. And as I've said many, many times, Nietzsche was absolutely right. It did burst. And in the 20th century, we have 100 million corpses to show for it. And we're still not sure whether to keep taking the medicine of religion to stave off nihilism or to accept the sickness of nihilism and try to overcome it ourselves. Just be the kind of person, the ubermensch, as Nietzsche calls it, the superman who can just look nihilism in the face and not even care and just overcome and build a system of morality around his own values, which, as we've talked about in episode uh, one of the series, that was who Hitler saw himself to be. So anyway, I am going to read a quote from Nietzsche that will send chills up your spine. This is an insane quote. This is good. Listen to this. Quote, The real danger lies in our loathing of man and our pity of him. 
If these two emotions should one day join forces, they would beget the most sinister thing ever witnessed on earth, man's ultimate will, his will to nothingness, nihilism. Pause quote. Did you just catch that? Nietzsche just described every mass shooter, every non-Islamic terror attack, every time that you hear of someone driving a car into a sidewalk of people or a mass killing or whatever, he just described what is going on in that person's mind. It's this, right here. I'm going to read it again from the beginning. Listen to this. Quote, The real danger lies in our loathing of man and our pity of him. If these two emotions should one day join forces, they would beget the most sinister thing ever witnessed on earth, man's ultimate will, his will to nothingness, nihilism. And indeed, preparations for that event are already well underway. One who smells not only with his nose, but also with his eyes and ears will notice everywhere these days an air as of a lunatic asylum or sanatorium. I am thinking of all the current cultural enterprises of man, of every kind of Europe now existing. It is the deceased who imperil mankind, not the beasts of prey. It is the predestined failures and victims who undermine the social structure, who poison our faith in life and our fellow man. Is there anyone who has not encountered the veiled, shuddered gaze of the born misfit, that introverted gaze which saddens us and makes us imagine how such a man must speak to himself? If only I could be someone else, the look seems to sigh but there's no hope of that. I am what I am. How could I get rid of myself? Nevertheless, I'm fed up, end quote. Nietzsche literally just described the quote-unquote weird kid at school who draws violence and gets bullied and has no friends. Someone who is a victim and a failure of the social structure. Someone who poisons our faith in life and our fellow men. Then Nietzsche asks, is there anyone who has not encountered the veiled, shuddered gaze of the born misfit? That introverted gaze which saddens us and makes us imagine how sad such a man must speak to himself, if only I could be someone else. But there's no hope of that. I am what I am, and I'm fed up. Man, I get chills just reading that, and I could not even believe when I understood what Nietzsche was saying. He was describing mass killers today, people who go into places of innocence and reverence and they kill as many people as they possibly can with straight stone cold faces, people that we can't even begin to wrap our minds around. And Nietzsche predicted it a hundred years ago. He goes, yeah, that's what happens when nihilism begins to creep in. And as a culture, we're finding that more and more people are losing their ascetic ideals to strive for which is evidenced by the opioid crisis, mass pornography addiction, sex trafficking, corruption, and destruction, really. Because what happens when someone hates and also takes pity on everyone? You get mass shooters, mass violence. You get stoic killers who wish they could push a button and end it all. But instead, we'll settle for just everyone they can touch with a bullet, and if they get worldwide renowned for doing it, and they shoot to the top of a short list of famous people to satisfy their cravings for attention, well, that's just the cherry on top. So what does religion do with these people when nihilism is starting to eat at them and, and they become depressed and downcast and they have that look that says, if only I could be someone else, but I can't and I'm fed up. What does religion do for those people? What does the ascetic ideal do to keep those people from becoming those people? How does religion address a would-be school shooter before they go down the darkest path that there is, before they lose all faith in the ascetic ideal? Well, nihilistic people hate happy people and successful people, and they should, says Nietzsche, because they are dominating them. But it is the job of the religious priest to redirect that anger and that loathing and that pity to themselves, so that they're Jealousy and their rage, the perfectly natural emotions based on who they are, are redirected to inflict 
damage upon themselves rather than everyone else. That's the role of Christianity, says Nietzsche. It's not because of them. It's, it's you. It's your sin. It's your depravity. You need to do this or that, or, and you need to fix yourself, and, and you need to work on yourself. Literally, if you want the pinnacle of what Nietzsche views the problem of Christianity to be, the role of Christianity, listen to my episode titled Depression, Suicide, and the Secret to Happiness. Everything I said, according to Nietzsche, is literally a pithy way of redirecting the blame for suffering back onto the depressed and nihilistic person to make sure that they won't hurt anyone else. That is literally the archetype of what Nietzsche is talking about. I fulfilled the archetype. And ironically enough, Nietzsche accurately identifies how Christians strive to treat depression. We say things like, try to love and serve other people and you'll discover that you've forgotten all about yourself. Or pursue God and, and you will not feel nihilistic anymore. Which, again, to Nietzsche would be pursue the ascetic ideal and you won't feel nihilistic. We'll say things like, try exercising and eating well to release the pent-up energy and anxiety. And then lastly, Nietzsche says that religion sucks people into a collective so that when the group succeeds, they too succeed and can kind of share in the success and won't feel like such a loser. Because the joy of success, even though they only partially contributed, can boost a self-esteemed nihilistic person or the self-esteem of a nihilistic person, excuse me. So apparently that's our secret. That's why we promote family and community and charity. It's it's a brilliant master plan in order to stop nihilistic people from feeling nihilistic and to keep people clinging on to their ascetic ideals so they don't descend into a very dark path. Well, honestly, I don't even know how to respond to Nietzsche. I'd like to transition, now that I've summarized his view and explained it, to trying to address it. This is the section where I'm going to address it. However, I literally don't know what else to do other than shrug and go, well, man... <laughs> If you want to believe that, I guess nobody can stop you. If you want to interpret every gesture of goodwill to just be a sinister, overtoned plan to manipulate and keep people from going down a dark path for their own self-interest, well, I don't know what to say to you. Nietzsche is such a fascinating and frustrating person to study because he sees that religion does fight nihilism, and we agree that without God, society will plummet into depression and nihilism. And we agree that you can't believe in God's rules unless you believe in God. And we agree that Christianity is responsible for the values that the world has today. And Nietzsche looks at all of those facts and he goes, yeah, no, I, I agree with you. But Christianity is a lie. Nihilism is true. And we have to overcome the meaninglessness ourselves because Society will plummet without Christianity, but that's a good thing because we need to rebuild even stronger and better. And the world as it is today needs to burn because Christianity has taken it over and trapped us in this cycle of depression, nihilism, anxiety, suicide, repeat. Keep people feeling well. Keep the sick quarantined from the healthy. Sick being the nihilistic and healthy being the people who are just chipper and marching along, pursuing their ascetic ideal. But in some sense, it's like, all right, man, we view the same facts. We recognize the same premises, but we literally run the track in opposite directions. I look at Christianity and think that it's a true and good thing. He looks at Christianity and says that it's a false and evil thing. No matter which thing you're talking about, which topic, which avenue, Christianity and Nietzsche are just polar opposites. And there comes a point where even though we're making the same observations, if he's just going to make the opposite conclusion, you have to just shrug and go, you know, you can't even really argue with that. If you want to be a cynical, atheistic nihilist, then, you know, I guess that's your prerogative. If you want to be an optimist and you want to interpret the facts in a positive way, I guess you'll be a Christian. But it's so interesting. That's why Nietzsche can be so powerful when arguing against conventional atheists. Because Nietzsche and, and I, Nietzsche and, and Christians, are often making the same observations. Observations like, without God, there's no such thing as truth. Morality comes from Christianity because Christianity is actually true. And without Christianity, morals are a lie. And if you convert to Christianity, 
God will help you not be nihilistic because there will be a true thing that's beautiful that's worth pursuing. Again, see depression, suicide, and the secret to happiness. And I say those things, and Nietzsche agrees with my premises. He just goes backwards. And it's very, very strange. And there's nothing else like it in philosophy. Existentialism comes close. And it has kind of the same principles. But Nietzsche is just so far beyond what existentialism can, can offer. He just goes overboard. And this is why Nietzsche is often considered an existentialist. But I don't know. It's, I don't know if that's quite fair. Nietzsche is just so extreme with his conclusions and, and observations. Even though I think his observations are true, his conclusions are so backwards, you, you can't even argue against it. You just have to go, well, if that's your perspective, I guess that's your perspective. <laughs> There's nothing else that I can really say. So that's kind of where you have to land when you're talking about Nietzsche or trying to refute Nietzsche. There, there's nothing else you can really say. So in conclusion here, just as Nietzsche said over 100 years ago, the, the questions that Christianity answered are still there. The West has taken away Christianity's answers, but they haven't supplied any new ones. And since the death of God, there has been a rise of nihilism. And honestly, I think this is the only non-controversial, jaw-dropping truth bomb that Nietzsche gave us. And I'm amazed it isn't taught in high school. Society seems completely oblivious to the obvious need for meaning, purpose, a grounding for morality, an explanation for why we are here or what we are doing or where we are going. And then when someone finds themselves angry and desperate and rejected and they go into the basement and think about this kind of stuff for six months and they go on a rampage to kill as many people as they can, we're all completely amazed. Well, yeah, he went on a search for answers to questions that you don't even talk about and he found his answers. What is life? pain and suffering? Why does it exist? An accident of evolution. Is there such a thing as right and wrong? Probably not. Doesn't look like it. Well, what happens when you die? Nothing. The lights just go off. So if life is pain and suffering, an accident of evolution, and nothing happens when you die, and you are very, very angry that you exist, and you hate everyone you know, it's not illogical to decide that you're going to be an agent that moves to destroy as many things that exist as possible. It's like the quote that I read from Nietzsche. It's the combination of a hate for mankind and a pity for mankind. And the result is an indifferent killer bent on eradicating all conscious existence. And until our society answers the questions about origin, morality, God, and destiny, and meaning, nihilism will spread. And as nihilism spreads, so will violence, mass shooting, drug use, the opioid epidemic, mass pornography addiction, sex trafficking, and political radicalism as a desperate attempt to control will lead to more and more invasive governmental policies and less and less freedoms for individuals. This is the philosophy of mass shooters. Call it crazy, call it insane, call it evil, demonic, twisted, whatever you want, but you cannot call it illogical. Listen to this quote from Nietzsche. If you're skeptical of all this, and I've lost you along the way, this will clear everything up. Quote, Until the advent of the ascetic ideal, man, the animal man, had no meaning at all on this earth. His existence was aimless. The question, why is there such a thing as man, could not have been answered. Man willed nothing, neither himself nor the world. Behold, every great human destiny there rang, like a refrain, and even greater, in vain. Man knew that something was lacking. A great vacuum surrounded him. He did not know how to justify, to explain, to affirm himself. His own meaning was an unsolved problem and made him suffer. He also suffered in other respects, being altogether an ailing animal. Yet what bothered him was not the suffering, but his inability to answer the question, what is the meaning of my trouble? Man, the most courageous animal and the most inured to trouble, does not deny suffering per se. He wants it. He seeks it out, provided that it can be given a meaning. Finally, the ascetic ideal arose to give it meaning, its only meaning so far. But any meaning is better than none. 
And in fact, the ascetic ideal has been the best stopgap that ever existed. Suffering had been interpreted. The door to all suicidal nihilism slammed shut. No doubt that interpretation brought new suffering in its wake, deeper, more inward, more poisonous suffering. It placed all suffering under the perspective of guilt. All the same, man had saved himself. He had achieved a meaning. He was no longer a leaf in the wind, a plaything of circumstance, of crass causality. He was now able to will something, no matter the object or the instrument of his willing. His will itself had been saved. We can no longer conceal from ourselves what exactly it is that this whole process of willing inspired by the ascetic ideal signifies. This hatred of humanity, of animality, of inert manner, this loathing of the senses, of reason even, this fear of beauty and happiness, the longing to escape from illusion, chance, becoming, death, and from longing itself. It signifies, let us have the courage to face it, a will to nothingness. A revulsion from life, a rebellion against the principal conditions of living. And yet, despite everything, it is and remains a will. Let me repeat, now that I have reached the end, what I said at the beginning, man would sooner have the void for his purpose than be void of purpose. End quote. What a powerful quote from Nietzsche. A little dense, I recommend rewinding and listening again, but did you catch that? To summarize, Nietzsche said that man's existence was aimless, and he found suffering unbearable because of the meaningless, uh, meaninglessness of it. And so he invented God and religion to stave off the suicidal nihilism of the meaninglessness of his suffering. And so he invented this apparatus to make sense of everything. The reason is that man will always strive for purpose. Even if that purpose becomes a rejection of God, a rejection of life, of beauty, of happiness, of illusion, of the senses, a fear of beauty and happiness, a hatred of humanity and animality, an inert manner, a hating of inert manner, this loathing of the senses, this longing to escape, to change, to become, this longing for death. Nietzsche says, quote, It signifies, let us face it, a will to nothingness, a revulsion from life, a rebellion against the principal conditions of living. And yet, despite everything, it is and remains a will. Let me repeat, now that I've reached the end, what I said at the beginning, man would sooner have the void for his purpose than be void of purpose, end quote. Powerful, powerful stuff. That's what we see today. We see people who would rather have the void for his purpose than be void of purpose. Well, I hope you enjoyed the series on Nietzsche. Thank you so much for listening. I really hope that you enjoyed it. Please let me know your thoughts on social media or leave a review on iTunes. I hope to see you back real soon in the Wellward Christian Podcast as we continue to talk about the value of Christianity for society historically and in the present. And we'll talk about that next week. I'll see you then. <laughs>